Hi, and welcome to the Qigong Effect. We're having this summit to discover how to boost your vitality, build resilience, and banish stress. I'm your host, Robert Bowley, and today I have the immense pleasure of talking with Janice Tucker. Janice is the founder of The Space to Relax. She also practices Chinese medicine and acupuncture, as well as teaching Qigong. She helps people who want to take positive steps to augment their health, Janice has spent the last 15 years helping and teaching thousands of face-to-face -face motivated clients and students to make huge differences to their state of physical, mental, and emotional health. Janice passionately believes in equipping her clients and students with tools which they can use to manage their health for themselves, rather than being indefinitely reliant upon the constant care of a practitioner. This encourages people to take responsibility for their own health, creates confidence and empowers the client or student so that they no longer feel helpless when it comes to their state of health. Welcome to the Qigong Summit, Janice. I'm delighted you're here. Thanks so much, Rob. It's really great that you invited me to be part of this wonderful event. You're more than welcome. So how about just starting things off by telling us a little bit about your background and how you first became involved in Chinese medicine and Qigong. Okay, well, my background is definitely not Chinese medicine and Qigong related. So by training, I'm a zoologist. I did my degree wow. and PhD in zoology. Yeah. And then um, by a few kind of roundabout ways, I went off and did a teacher training course. I'm also a qualified school teacher, science teacher. Okay. Um, but didn't, didn't really go into that, but always loved teaching. And I moved to Ireland in about 1997. And at that time, it was very difficult to find a job in either teaching or in science. So I found myself having to diversify. And the way in which I did that was to take professional careers advice with a company that I paid money to. I did all of their psychological testing and their, you know, profile personality profiling and all that kind of thing and they came up with acupuncture and Chinese medicine as one of the possible career choices for me wow, I'm, and I'm it was great yeah and I, I kind of I looked around to see what was in Dublin I was living in Dublin at the time and there was actually a really good Chinese medicine college just around the corner from where I lived and uh, so I looked into that and a few other things but decided on acupuncture and Chinese medicine and studied that um and had a great time doing that in Dublin and uh, qualified in 2000. So straight from there, the director of our college was very keen to get into Qigong. He saw it as a really kind of up and coming practice that not so many people knew about 20 years ago. It was here, it was in Ireland and Europe, but not in a big way like Tai Chi would have been at the time. Yeah, yeah. And he said, this is a really great thing. This is going to be much more popular in the future. And so he had been out to China and lined up um, a study, a, a kind of course of study with a couple of professors at the University of Traditional Chinese Medicine in Guangzhou in China. And so we as a group, straight from me as a new graduate, went out to China for a month. So there were students from my course, but also the lecturers from my course went out because none, none of us had done Qigong before. Yeah. So we went and studied for, um, for a month in the university. So it was kind of a morning. Every morning was lectures, theory, and then every afternoon was practice. And there was a, also a teaching hospital adjacent to the university. So we actually got to go into the hospital and do oh, some amazing. work. And, do some qigong as well yeah it was really good so did that for the did that for a month came back and then i was um i was practicing my own qigong i was practicing i just started my chinese medicine my acupuncture practice so everything's completely new for me but yeah. just so interesting i just loved it so then when we had the opportunity then to go out to china on a, another three separate occasions for three further months um, in the following years, I went on all of those trips because I just loved it so much. Yeah, um, yeah. And by the kind of maybe by the second or third trip, the professors that we were working with said, "Look, you know, it, you can teach this. You can teach all the basic qigong exercises very safely to your clients." It was their wish. It was their dream for qigong to be become much more widely spread in the West. They, you know, obviously they were they were practicing in China and they were not of the school where everything was kept within the family and it was all very secret, which is right. how Qigong used to be uh, yeah. passed on and taught. Yeah. 
yeah. but they really were very interested in that you know the medical perspective and arming people with you know really simple easy qigong exercises that they could practice for themselves in order to manage their health so, so was this then, a specific kind of qigong that they were teaching them they just they they always called it medical qigong it was not from a lineage or a family it was medical qigong so it was only available for us to learn because we were already Chinese medicine practitioners. Right. It was yeah. taught within the University of Chinese Medicine in Guangzhou, which I believe at the time had 10,000 students, oh. all studying Chinese medicine. Right. If you think about our universities here, where yeah. we might have big universities with 10,000 students, but all the subjects are different. This yeah. was all Chinese medicine, and there was a whole Qigong, medical Qigong department within the university as a branch of Chinese medicine. Yeah. So there are different styles of qigong as you as you know and maybe many of your listeners don't know but mm. there are styles that apply to martial arts as the as the shaolin monks would practice um there are styles that are more spiritual and more kind of uh you know buddhist or meditative in their in their approach and i guess all of them really have a benefit to health but this was really specifically working with qigong exercises which would allow the flow of chi or of energy as we know it through through the body to and really promote that to be unimpeded so that once everything is free flowing yeah. then that natural state of health of your body returns to its optimum and that right. that's all it is i mean qigong is really just opening up the pathways by which people can have that free flow and experience that in their bodies and then the body just naturally comes back into a state of balance so it was all medical stuff. And was this, this was taught, um, uh, um, was this Qigong um, given to the people in the, uh, was it a university hospital? Was it? What? It was the University of Traditional Chinese Medicine in Guangzhou. And so it oh. was taught to us as a group, uh, as a private group. We booked the yeah. teachers as a private group. So yeah. there were 12 of us initially when we, oh. when we went out there. Um, and so it was taught in a, a kind of a class setting in the morning yeah, so yeah. It, the professors were a husband and wife team so yeah. um he would he would teach all the theory in the morning and his wife often was the one who did the practice in the afternoon which was based on whatever the morning's theory was yeah. and it was progressive in the way it went through so each of the exercises built upon previous ones and um and obviously there was a lot of kind of chinese medicine theory interwoven with yeah, that as well yeah. from that medical perspective I'm interested with that. Where, whilst you were there, did you manage to find out how it was practiced or, or taught over there? Was it integrated within the as a therapy within a hospital environment or? Yeah, it was. It was. We actually got to do that. Ah. So we had clients coming in for qigong treatments as well. So we were we were taught during the course of our studies. We were taught to emit or to send out qi from our hands, yeah. so to be able to to treat clients using that and in the hospital setting that would have been one of the um, modes of therapy along with cupping and moxibustion acupuncture um twin hour massage uh, herbal medicine as well so often a patient would come to the hospital from my understanding they came in and they might see maybe two or three different specialist practitioners during the course of that treatment um, and then go downstairs to the, the Chinese pharmacy and get the prescription of herbs to bring away with them. So they got yeah. like a, a kind of a whole package of treatments, depending on yeah. the person and what was going on with them. Yeah, yeah. And just to, just to clarify, because you with in terms of the medical qigong, because there are um, because people who are listening to this, the listeners might not be aware that. Uh, there is a qigong for medical qigong that you practice yourself, but also mm -hmm. there's a medical qigong that you you um, you do for somebody else. Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah. So so what we we learned both, okay. but what I teach to people is what to, they can do for themselves because right. obviously my students, nearly all my students, then none of them are Chinese medicine practitioners. So yeah. I'm not teaching people how to treat other people. Yeah. I teach people how to do it for themselves okay. um, and and obviously that's what people want they want yeah. something that they can use to help themselves although I do use it you know I, I would use the other kind myself where I'm sending out chi 
I would use it not as a, not as an individual treatment. That's not the way in which I work. Yeah. But I find it works very well in combination with acupuncture. Um, so it can by sending out chi myself when I'm actually performing acupuncture on someone, I can re enhance and strengthen an acupuncture yeah. treatment oh, by using qigong along, you know, as part of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, as somebody um, practicing the qigong movements themselves, what kind of benefits could they expect? Well, very quickly, what my students tell me is that they immediately feel relaxed. So that's right. one of the things that's yeah. always the most common thing when when we are working together in a workshop, um, they would also always say they feel very relaxed, they feel very calm and also very clear in their mind. So they right. they finish, they may they may finish an exercise and feel great clarity and great focus in the mind in that the mind chatter that we all experience from time to time with our busy lives has yeah. calmed down somewhat. Yeah. And I find that especially when they do a movement where there are a number of different elements to it. So it might be something that they look at and they think, oh, wow, that looks really complicated to do that. So when I teach it, I break it down into the separate elements and, and teach it very, you know, bit by bit, yeah. build it up slowly so that people, you know, just get the hang of the first bit before moving on to the second bit. And yeah. by the time they're doing the whole thing, they're so busy thinking about where everything is, where their body is, where their breath is, where their mind is, that the mind chatter stuff and what they're going to have for dinner that night or the shopping list or the kids or any of that, that's gone out the window. There's no space for that in their brains. Yeah. And they're always really surprised by that because there are very few things we do where we're not thinking about something else at the same time. Yeah. Um, another example of those kind of things we do alongside Qigong would be something like um, if you do any kind, if anyone does any kind of extreme sports. Yeah. So if you do something like surfing or mountain biking or climbing or something where you have to be really focused and really yeah. in the zone. Yeah. Um, also music as well. I think if people yeah. are playing music, yeah. they find that they get really get into the zone and they get kind of yeah. almost lost in it. Um, yeah. But there are not many things that we do. Usually what we're doing in our day-to-day -day lives is we're not fully aware, we're not fully conscious of the actual thing we're doing. We're yeah. always thinking about something else. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yes, yeah, so that, so the relaxation is one thing. The clarity of mind and that calming the mind chatter is another thing. Um, and then kind of further on down the line, people would notice with, with continued practice, things like aches and pains and stiffness and discomfort on that physical level may start to ease for them okay. they might start to feel more energetic um yeah. they have more energy better sleep would be i mean better sleep can come very quickly yeah. even the night after you know after teaching a workshop many of my students would text me the next day and say oh my goodness i had such a great night's sleep last night yeah. what was i doing <laughs> yesterday <laughs> that made that happen yeah um so and obviously sleep problems are a major issue for yeah. many people yeah so it's a way in which people can manage their sleep um and then on the more kind of emotional side of things, people can very healthily uh, really work through emotions and allow them, you know, things like grief and sadness, anxiety, really allow them to be processed and to be um, eased in, in the body and the mind in a healthy way. So not like you're putting a lid on something, but more like you're allowing those emotions to flow through you, to come out and be expressed in a healthy way um, and gain some kind of peace of mind at the end of that. And if you ask most people really what they want in their life, they'll come back to, if you, if you quiz them enough, they'll come back to happiness, contentment, peace of mind, good relationships with other people, all those kinds of things. And uh, Qigong can really bring that ab about quite, quite quickly for people in certain situations, more slowly in others. But, you know, Qigong is a bit like riding, to, riding a bike or learning to swim. You build up the skill gradually as you practice. You're not 100% perfect at it to begin with. Um, you don't expect to be. You just enjoy the bits that you're really getting the benefit from and then appreciate that there are other bits that might just take a little bit while, a bit more of a, a time to come. Um, but that's fine too. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting because when you look at the in a in a bookshop, um, and you go under the self help department, there's just a huge um, collection of of different uh, life coaching, transformational things out ways that you can help with emotion, stress, and all that kind of thing. But 
from what you're saying, it sounds like Qigong is a very natural way of dealing with um, tension or the mental chatter or the emotions, yeah? Absolutely, because you're working with your body's own chi or energy. And our professors always said that, you know, all energy has a frequency, a vibration. And it's, if you can use your own frequency, that's the frequency, obviously, that's the most in tune with you. When you start to introduce other medicines, herbal medicine, for example, or medications, they have a different frequency. They're not quite at the same level as us. So although they obviously may work, um, they're not at the same frequency. They're not the same kind of match. So our professors always said, if you're working with your own, your own chi, your own energy at the same frequency, you're getting the maximum benefit with the minimum amount of, well, no side effects really, because it's yeah. your own it's part of you that you're working with. So yeah, it is, it is very natural. Um, and it can draw on, on nature as well. You can use the chi of your environment. And, you know, if you're in a lovely kind of healthy environment in the forest or by the sea, I think we all know that just from, if you walk through a forest, you don't have to be a Qigong practitioner to know that you feel better after being around that lovely fresh kind of energy of trees or if you're walking on the beach that kind of really invigorating sea air that's you know that's the chi that you're inhaling that's what you're bringing into your body and gaining the benefit from so even that and not having the awareness of it being qigong it, it yeah. is it's where it's bringing in the the elements of nature that can really help as well yeah and is there on, on that on that particular one which i find it really interesting is there a is there a way that when you are aware of that, that you can enhance that uh, possibility of interacting with nature when you're in, for example, a forest or, or, a, or by the sea? Is there some way that you can interact with it in a way? Oh, definitely. It? I mean, for me, like, I, I'm looking, if I live in Ireland, and so I have the mountains at the back of my house, I have the sea at the front of my house. So I'm, I'm spoiled for choice and I love this yeah. because I can choose where I want to go to to gain my energy, to get my yeah. chi um, yeah. on any particular day. Um, but all I do is I, I go walking and I just work with abdominal breathing. I just breathe into my belly, feel my belly expand as I breathe in, as I breathe out, feel the belly shrink. And all I'm doing is just thinking of bringing that energy in. I'm just having that that presence of mind really to uh, to be aware that I'm bringing in really clean nourishing fresh air from wherever whichever environment I'm in but then also as I breathe out I'm breathing anything out that I don't want so yeah. I just decide okay I'm just feeling a little bit I might decide oh I'm feeling a little bit anxious today so as I exhale I'm just thinking of exhaling the anxiety out into the environment and leaving it float away and it's just having that awareness around that mm -hmm. now I would teach that as a more formal kind of breathing exercise um, in my workshops and, and my online course, but you don't have to do that. You can just have that as a mindful kind of practice as yeah. you're walking along in an environment. Yeah. Also, I suppose if you're if you're somewhere in in amongst trees, you can just go and lean up against a tree, and you can just breathe and just feel that contact with the tree, and mm. just feel you know the energy of a big old tree. I think yeah. you know anyone who's kind of tuned into their, into their environment. Yeah. will feel that that's very yeah. different from a feeling you get from you know compared with walking around a city yeah so yeah. you know there, we, we all are well aware of that and yeah. um anyone actually who's interested in that can just do a search online for something called forest bathing oh, i don't know yeah. if you've come across it yeah, yeah. so the Jap japanese doctors now are recommending that people with depression and anxiety go walking in the forest and this is called forest bathing to just to absorb the energy yeah. the chi of the trees yeah. as a therapeutic thing yeah. before they're giving out antidepressants that's what that they're amazing? doing so if, if yeah. you google forest bathing there's loads of really lovely interesting kind of articles on that it's really it's really good yeah. it's excellent yeah so there's many ways in which you can interact with the environment absolutely and also i have to say on the other side i get a similar feeling when i'm near my cat <laughs> yeah oh yeah because animals have their own you know they yeah. have their own chi kind of giving off their own their own chi but cats are kind of interesting because what cats will do is they'll they'll come and sit on you 
They'll yeah. sit next to you or they'll sit right on your chest if you're lying in bed at night. They're just sitting in your chi fields. They're just sucking the chi out of you. Because they, <laughs> love, they love your chi as much as you love theirs. <laughs> so they're gaining the chi. But I remember years ago, my, um, my last dog that I had, I, I used to stop on the beach when I was walking the dog. I'd stop and I might do five minutes of qigong practice, yeah. maybe a bit of movement or something. And the dog could be miles away miles away and as soon as I stopped to do qigong within literally a minute the dog was sitting at my feet and he oh, wouldn't move amazing wouldn't move he's just was just sitting in the chi field yeah. bathing and lapping it all up as I was practicing they're very they're very intuitive they can they know it's there they have another sense going on around that I, for sure. I think they do <laughs> yeah 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 it's very interesting it seems to me that from what you're saying that it, uh, by practicing through, in the particular way you, you, you approach it, it's a very intentional practice. So you, your mind is directed in a particular way, which I guess is part of the, um, the secret of, of connecting with yourself. It, yeah, it, it is, uh, definitely. So for those people who don't have any experience of Qigong, hmm. For me and the way in which I teach it, I would teach it as a combination of three elements. And the three elements are firstly, movement, very simple movement. Yeah. Secondly, your breathing. And thirdly, your mind. So those three things, what you're aiming for is to kind of link them together. And so right. you would link them together initially by paying attention, by, okay. by focusing your mind. Not too hard though, because if you focus with this kind of almost like this laser beam focus using your mind, you could give yourself a headache by yeah. almost concentrating too much. Yeah. So it's, a, you know, it's a kind of a very gentle focus. It's just really more paying attention to what's going on. Yeah. But then eventually with a lot of practice, as you practice more, you turn that conscious practice into, it just becomes unconscious. So yeah. it's like the more you practice a particular exercise, the more it runs on autopilot. So it becomes like almost like your body and your breath are really moving themselves and you're yeah. just enjoying the experience and maybe yeah. more just observing the flow and the, you know, the way in which your body or your mind feels and the different sensations that are going on. But yeah. you're not consciously thinking, oh, now I must breathe into here or now I must move this arm or this leg or now I must like focus my mind on this part. It doesn't happen that way once you've done a little bit of practice. Again, a bit like riding a bike or like yeah. swimming. You're not yeah. thinking when you're riding a bike, oh, where is, you know, where's my balance now? Where's my head? Where are my shoulders? Uh, you know, and, and thinking about every different element of how I'm turning the handlebars. Mm. Eventually, you are at the beginning when you're learning. You're yeah. very conscious of that because you don't want to fall off. Yeah. But, but eventually it becomes unconscious. And then you're just focusing on where you're going and enjoying what you see around you. So it's, there's a really nice analogy there between mm -hmm. learning to ride a bike or learning to swim yeah. um, and, the, and developing that skill so that it becomes an unconscious practice where then you're just almost like you're bathed in it and you're just observing what's going on around it and just enjoying it, really. Yeah, yeah. You know, a lot of people um, suffer from, uh, whether it's, um, they're aware of it or not, from tension, physical and and emotional and, and mental tension. How does that play out in, in somebody, a beginner starting Qigong? Does it, <laughs> is it something that happens naturally or how does it play out? In terms of how do they resolve it or yeah. what do I see? What do I see when they're oh, learning? Both. <laughs> okay, Give us so when they're, learning, <laughs> when they're learning, what I often see is that their shoulders are, they wear their shoulders as earrings. So the shoulders are <laughs> here like this. So I, I say to all, most of my clients are ladies and I'm like, ladies, we do not wear our shoulders as earrings. We have our own, plenty of our own earrings, drop your shoulders. So that's the first thing, always, always. I, I don't know how many times I say, say, say it when I'm teaching. I'd be like, drop your shoulders, drop your shoulders, drop your shoulders. And, and people forget. Yeah. Um, we do it when we're driving as well. When you're driving a car, you find that your shoulders creep up here as you're driving along. Yeah. So it's always drop your shoulders. It's the first thing. And the other thing in terms of relieving tension is to always remember to smile. Smile during your practice because the smiling really relaxes all your facial muscles. And it really has an impact emotionally as well. 
Um, when you're smiling on the outside, the smile then starts to happen on the inside. And you feel it's almost, you, you can feel this lovely relaxation wave spreading through your body as you smile. And usually when people are learning Qigong, they're so busy concentrating on what they're doing at the beginning, yeah. they're all scowling. <laughs> they're all you know, really, really trying to focus hard with scowly faces. And so I'm like, okay, everyone, drop your shoulders and smile. And usually what happens when I say that is everyone bursts out laughing yeah. because they realize how much tension they've been holding. Um, so it's, and, and it's all about, and all the time as, as I'm teaching, I'm encouraging people to really just experience smooth, soft, even flow. And when they're moving, I'd say to people, just imagine that you're moving your hands through melted chocolate or treacle syrup. You know, just having that idea of this lovely kind of smooth flow, but it's a little bit thicker. It's like the air is a little bit thicker as you're moving through. And then yeah. you can really feel all the lovely sensations, like the tingly, buzzy sensations of chi in your hands then. Yeah. Once people get that, that's when they're hooked because they're like, wow, this is magic. What's going on here? My hands are yeah. really warm. And they're all buzzy yeah. and this is great. <laughs> um, so that's, and, and that's really important that people enjoy what they're doing as well. So people, if they come in and they're really tense and they're really stressed when they come into my class, I want them to go away and I want them to feel happy and relaxed when they're leaving um, and that they've really enjoyed what they've been doing. Um, and we always know that because it feels like coming into a Qigong class, if you're in a nice Qigong class, it feels like you're going into a time war. It feels uh, like five minutes yeah, is yeah. A, and you've been there an hour. It's just like, whoa, what happened to the time just there? That just went so quickly. Because you yeah. people become so immersed in it, in, in yeah. the enjoyment of it, yeah. really. Yeah. yeah, and I'm sure I'm with that. I'm certain that people coming to your Qigong classes have a, a thoroughly good time. Well, I hope they do, because that's the aim. Is that you know, there's no, I'm, I'm a great believer in any kind of exercise, whatever you're doing with this exercise or meditative practice. There's no point doing it if you don't enjoy it, because if you don't enjoy it, you won't keep doing it. And it yeah. won't benefit you. It's yeah. not, you, you shouldn't be making yourself do this, these, any of these kind of things. You know, with exercise, I say to all my clients in my Chinese medicine practice, they come in and I'd always encourage people to take some kind of exercise, yeah. obviously. But yeah. I say, don't pick something you don't like. Don't yeah. go and punish yourself in the gym if you hate the gym. Yeah. Go and pick something you love and go and do that. Go and do something you enjoy because then you'll get much more out of it. You're much more likely to be motivated to do it to, and to keep it going. And, yeah. you know, you, you'll get the benefit. And the same with Qigong. If yeah. you practice, if you start practicing Qigong and you don't like it, go and do something else. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of things to choose to do. Yeah. But yeah. Qigong is a really nice way of, it's very simple. Almost anyone can do it. It can be adapted to all kinds of ages and abilities, physical and uh, kind of intellectual abilities as well. I've taught Qigong to people with special needs, to people in wheelchairs. Um, all the exercises can be very easily adapted yeah. to a yeah. whole range of people. Um, yeah. Children love it. They think it's magic too. Yeah. Um, I teach it to, to small children as well and they love okay. it too. So, um, yeah, so um, just, but, but just is, always for everyone, I just say pick something you love. Yeah. And I think the lovely thing is as well, as opposed to kind of your usual run-of-the-mill exercise classes, it's not about putting everything into it and straining and pushing to get a result. It's more about just allowing things to happen as they naturally do. And, and, and the process just kind of evolves, yeah? That's actually crucial. That's what you said there is a really important point. It's about allowing. It's not about making anything happen. So with Qigong, all you're doing is you are creating the conditions in your mind or your body by which the chi can flow freely. It's like you're clearing the pathway that might be blocked with a few weeds and bramble bushes and you're making the, the pathway open so then the chi can flow. You're not making the chi flow. So you're just creating the, con the these lovely conditions yeah. by which it can move in an unimpeded way. Um, and it is about it is about allowing. And one day, you might practice and you might find the allowing is all happening and it, you're, it's all good. And then another day you, you might find there's nothing going on and that's okay too. Cause you might come back to it again the next day and it's all, it's all good again. So yeah. it depends very much on your state from day to day as to how much allowing is able to take place. Um, yeah. Yeah. But that's just the nature of the body. 
Yeah. But once you understand that, then there is no, there's no impatience, there's no forcing, there's none of that. It's just like, okay, well, today wasn't as great a day as yesterday, but maybe tomorrow will be even more fantastic. You just don't know. You just yeah. go with the flow with it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Oh, I can see that. Yeah. That's that's beautiful. I love that yeah. because so many people are caught up in in uh, doing, and I, I kind of sometimes make the joke of that there are a lot of human doings. And actually, what we with Qigong, you start to be a human being. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and experience. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And just be in the experience and just and just enjoy it. Just enjoy the the benefits, whatever they might be on that day. And some yeah. days those benefits might be huge and profound, and yeah. other days they might be small, but they're still there. They're still there, and know that still, you know, there is still something going on. Um, inside, even if you don't perceive it as such, there still will be things happening, um, and uh, they may it may be just that things are building, waiting for that lovely kind of profound experience. You just don't know. Um, That's interesting. Because I was going to, to ask either. you. I was going to ask you how you know we we there's obviously the formal qigong class or practice, but what how can one kind of bring the qigong practice into one's everyday life? Or does it just happen? Well, one of the things in terms of teaching in my workshops and on my, I have an online program of Qigong video lessons as well. And I always stress in both, both the online and the face-to-face -face workshops that it's really good if you can integrate the practice into your day because most of the people I speak to, their main barrier for, you know, that they come up against for not practicing any kind of meditation, Qigong, Tai Chi, yoga whatever it might be that they're wanting to do their main thing that they say is stopping them is a lack of time mm -hmm. so they're like i have no time my life's too busy i don't have time to put aside practice every day so i very quickly identified that that was a you know an, an obstruction for people an obstacle and so i wanted to help them overcome that so most of the exercises i teach will have some element by which they can integrate it into the day so the abdominal breathing, for example, just doing simple breathing, you can do that when you're in bed at night. You can do it when you're watching TV, driving the car. You can do it uh, when you're standing in a queue at the airport or the supermarket. <laughs> and nobody knows you're doing it because yeah. you're, standing, you're just standing there with your eyes open and you're breathing. But you know what you're doing. And so you've done an element of your practice there already. So I always say to people now, don't ever think that standing in a queue is a waste of time because it, it isn't. It's an opportunity to practice Qigong. Yeah. Also, the, the Qigong standing posture, which is basically just standing with your feet hip width distance apart and just being relaxed in the knees and the lower back and getting lovely length in the back of the neck and just really standing there and, and being very focused on dropping the shoulders and all of that stance is an exercise in itself. You can do that in a queue. You know, you can do that anywhere you're standing in a queue. Um, there are some exercises that you can't do as such, you know, like that, where, you know, people, if they're around, they'll know you're doing something that's different. Um, but even some of those exercises that involve specific movements, you can do them. If you go out for a walk, you can just stop for five minutes somewhere and just do them. And most people, even if there's people around you and they're looking, they're not going to think you're weird because they might just think you're doing a few stretching exercises yeah. or something. And yeah. many people do that now. So um, I would encourage people just not to be self-conscious in that kind of situation. And just stop for five minutes and do a little bit of the you know, Qigong stretching or whatever it is you've learned um, and work with that and integrate that into your day. So it's, what's great about it is that then you're never wasting any time. Yeah. You're never wasting yeah. time. You can, you know, I would do my Qigong. There's a Qigong kind of walking exercise that I teach. So when I'm walking the dog on the beach, that's the walking I do. Yeah. And if I'm on my own, if I'm with someone else and I'm chatting with them, that's different. But mm. if I'm on my own and I've got a chance to focus and get that exercise going, then I will do, I'll do that when I'm on, on the beach with the dog. So, yeah. um, so pe different people find ways in which to weave in exercises into their day. And I've had a great one. Well, I had a great um, uh, way in which you can do this. I teach, a, I teach an exercise where you kind of, you just stand up and down and you kind of vibrate your body 
to rid any kind of what's called waste chi or waste energy from your body. And people will find that's quite a common exercise that Qigong practitioners do. And you look, it looks a bit weird. You know, it looks a bit strange. <laughs> so one of my students had a terrible time at work with colleagues. She was in a really bad kind of atmosphere at work. And there was this one particular person that really used to wind her up and make herself make her really angry. So you, she used to go into the cubicle in the toilets of work and do the vibrating exercise to rid all the, the yeah. anger. Yeah. So she'd go and do that for a couple of minutes, come out of the bathroom, feel great again afterwards, and they've got rid of everything, and she's yeah. back into work again. And they yeah. just think she's been to the toilets. So, <laughs> <laughs> so people find the weirdest ways in which to um, integrate Qigong into the day. You just but, have to um, be a little creative and imagine. Creative, it. yeah, get creative, I would say, definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, listen, unfortunately, we're coming to an end. It's been fantastic. Is there, if you wanted um, the listeners to have, to remember one thing, to take away one thing from this um, chat, what would that be? I would say that if you, as someone who's about to learn Qigong, if you've never done any Qigong before, go and find a teacher if you can. Obviously face-to-face -face is much better than anything else. If you can't find somebody um, online, I have an online program myself, um, you can find me easily by just going to space to relax.com. But I would say the best way is if you can find a face to face teacher, that's really good. And then pick a couple of really simple exercises that that teacher teaches you and just work with those, enjoy them and relax. Just relax and be comfortable and enjoy them for what they are. Just enjoy being out in nature and really just have a good time with that. And then move on to the you know, other ones that you may decide or other ones that are maybe a little bit more complicated. But don't ever get stressed about practicing Qigong. The main thing when you're practicing is that you should be comfortable and relaxed. That's it. If you're comfortable and relaxed, you're doing it right. People get too head up in the minutiae of, am I breathing at the right time? Am yeah. I moving in the right way? Am I doing this right, that right? And I get those questions all the time. And I say, well, were you comfortable and relaxed doing it? And they say, yeah. And I'm like, well, you were doing it right then. Yeah. yeah. Don't stress about it. There's all of this stuff and instruction online about all of this really complicated stuff. You don't need to go there with that. It's about promoting the free flow of chi. And that can only flow when you're comfortable and relaxed. Yeah. And don't, and, and don't wear your shoulders as earrings. Because <laughs> I do that. I used to do that all the time. And it's a real, it's a continuing practice for me is to keep my yeah. shoulders down. <laughs> well, but yeah, I'm yeah, going to take that away from me. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Janice, for a wonderful interview and sharing You're your very time welcome. with us. I'm so grateful. And, and I know it's going to be hugely valuable to the listeners. And uh, so that's it for today, folks. But stay tuned for another fantastic interview coming your way tomorrow.